you have to embrace this. You have to re-win every audience. How, how do you um, how do you approach this before you go well, out? Well, I I don't um, I don't want to win an audience. I, I I I want I want the audience. I think the audience is going to sound tremendously arrogant. But I say, but that's the way I feel. I think, and it's a great, often a disappointment. The audience doesn't understand a lot of what I'm trying to do and what I sometimes succeed in doing. Mm -hmm. and that's sad. I don't think I. Re I think Arthur Rubinstein was the consummate uh, master at seducing uh, an audience. Uh, would do anything to have the audience in his pocket. There are certain my great friend and, and colleague Isaac Stern is like that too. He's, he is an extrovert to him. I mean, he cannot go on the stage without having that be his first priority. He's got to dominate and got to charm an audience and does. Uh, and he's a great player and as Rubenstein is a great player. To me, uh, I, uh, there are there are subtleties and depths in uh, in 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 music not that those artists are not capable of attaining them but i want the audience to get that message from me rather than to win them on the ob more obvious terms uh and that i pay a price for that because there are fewer people that understand what i do than what uh, what that what understood uh, Arthur Rubinstein. Although Arthur Rubinstein, of course, began really the best part of his career at at approximately my age today, which is fifty seven. Uh, he didn't have an easy career. In fact, I, I think I've had a better career up till now than 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 even this most famous of all our sort of virtuosos of, of the last fifty years, at least. Nevertheless. Uh, he often uh, he, he would say, why, well, the public doesn't want me to play Mozart. I love Mozart, but the public doesn't want me to play Mozart. Well, why don't you play Mozart? Because you want to play Mozart. Uh, well, they won't engage me, you know, laughing embarrassingly about that. I remember once um, when he was playing 17 Concerti, he had this series here in New York, and, and uh, uh, I and Gary Grafman and Fleischer and Latiner, a group of us young, we were younger, younger pianists, and bought a box to that, to that whole series. It was a very nice thing for us to do, which, uh, really, in a, in in a sense, it must he he must have received that as a great tribute, really. I mean, what greater tribute can you have than to have the very gifted young people in the younger generation want to attend your that's a greater compliment than... And then I called Rubenstein one day, and I said, how are you? And he said, well, the house is sold out. My performance, and I can't tell you how disappointed I was. Here, this venerable, this great, great figure, again, hero worship in, in a sense, but that's not the answer that I wanted to hear from this, this personification of the grandiose 19th century marvelous charmer and seducer and and uh, uh, magic maker of the piano uh, who could pl play such phrases in Chopin as to make my hair stand on end with their beauty. I didn't want him to tell me the house was sold out. That's the sort of thing that Gypsy Rose Lee tells a girl in, in a... In, uh, in in front of a mirror in the ladies' room or something, dearie, but make get up your makeup or something. It's not, it was disappointing that uh, to me the, the 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 to be an artist is the most enormous privilege that that anybody can have. It's the highest human uh, activity, in, to my mind, is practicing. Art, whether it's painting or poetry or music or dance or whatever, this is the very best thing a person can do. And to be very Higher gifted, than medicine even. I think it's because it's it's with the it's not it's not material. I mean, it has the thing itself has to do with the mind and the spirit and 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 with with reaching up beyond the physical. Uh, where and did you get that attitude? Uh, Which just, is hard. Just, did it come in your household? Did it? 
No, it came it came from my own my my own experience, my my own realization that the thing the most important impressions I had in life were of things of of indescribable, uh, 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 untouchable sort of beauty. How would you describe how would you describe a phrase in Beethoven or in Mozart or a, or or a, um, um, a line? Uh, uh, in a drawing, you know, or of a, of a great painter, uh, or any great line, or a line of poetry, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, these these things lead beyond description, or or uh, that isn't even a even that isn't even the right reason for it. It just beca- it demonstrates it demonstrates and puts one in a dimension that's higher and more extreme and it's uh, as close to being a god I think is one can feel one like can a god be. playing the rock second can't they when you're out there it's like or experiencing yeah. or listening to it or thinking about it Eugene um, uh, you spoke of Virgil Thompson before and I once asked him about why he never taught and he says oh the taint of pedagogy I'm not going to get into your views right this second about teaching, but what I'd like to do is is have a view of um, uh, we have like a whole bag full of contented little artisans, a great ship of mediocrity in this country, institutionalized artists on, on every level. Pianists. I asked a pianist friend recently, I said, oh, are you still playing the Chopin mazurkas? Oh, I don't practice anymore. He's been at, at a university for 20 years. I don't practice anymore. I'm interested in my uh, sailing on Sunday. Uh, I said, wow, you're, you're, you're a perfect example of what I call the middle class artist in America. We have pianists galore and they have their tenure in music schools and, 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 and they moan that they don't play. What are they about? What is what is is this also part of this great egalitarian pool of of mediocrity? Well, David, um, I can't give you the I, I, I give you my impressions, and they may not be very simpatico, but I remember Rilke's admonition to a, the young poet in the letters to a young poet, where he where he to paraphrase it says, "Ask yourself in the stillness of the night, do I have to do this? And if you can, if there's any reason, any circumstance under which you can, you will say no. I I can live without it. Then for heaven's sake, stop. Don't do it. And your friend who goes sailing on Sunday and doesn't need mu- music anymore shouldn't have begun in the first place to take to take it." Seriously, that is to say, seriously in terms of deciding that he was going to make his life's work that. I think one must need art. One must need to paint. One must need to write. One must need music. One must need not be able to live without it in order to do it, whether one is good or bad. The minute one says, I'm in it because I want to be the tops in it, and if I'm not tops, I'm going to get out. That's fine. Get out as soon as you find out that you're not going to be tops because you're going to be miserable all your life. And unfortunately, we are in a profession where there is the most envious, the most backbiting, probably because music is so sublime that it's so tragic that people who are so close to achieving so, something so wonderful are so embittered when they come to the realization that they're not able to achieve it. This mm-hmm. is very... Very tragic. Um, Very tragic. Near, near, near misses are so frequent. Near misses. Oh. So many are. Mm. Um, and th- then, of course, I'm a near miss. Mm. I, I couldn't make a career as a pianist. Mm. So I, I said I couldn't do anything else but music, so I have continued and done what I could and, and made a living this way, a music director, programming, would whatever, you have, Would you have rather been a, a, an executive of some chemical no. corporation with so, earning $500,000, a million dollars a year no. and, go, and having four pianos and making music for your own pleasure no. at home? No, so I, I go by what you just said, that I would, um, I would prefer to stay in it. And, if, you know, Mom wrote in, in Moon and Sixpence something like, uh, if you want to be a gentleman, you must... Give up being an artist because an artist would sell his mother to the workhouse. 
<laughs> That's a little, yes, I remember that. That's a little what Mom might have done, but some artists didn't do well, that. He was a vicious man. Yes, he but was. Not every Behind artist that is, is a, a statement that we're discussing. It's about that's compromise. Well, we spoke about Sirkin. Here's a man who didn't sell his mother, but he wouldn't compromise. He would never compromise. Mm -hmm. He lie about any anything except mu in the music. He never lies. Never. Mm -hmm. So I admire I I I, I admire that. Um, I, I don't think that Mom, uh, although he's a great writer, it's irrelevant that I think he's a great writer. But yes. I, I I don't think that he that that uh, that is the ultimate. Uh, that's a sort of a description of Wagner, but it's not a description of Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Here he was a, the ultimate moral man, very moral mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. Of course, in this case, it was a description of Gauguin. Gauguin, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the writer Margaret Anderson, she was the first to publish Joyce, you know, in the little review, mm -hmm. whatever it was, mm -hmm. and she came out of Chicago. She loved piano. She knew Harold Bauer very well. She wrote, she wrote something that interested me, and I'm gonna, I've not asked anyone this ever. Uh, she said, most criticism is largely reportorial. Critics tell you how the music was written, how it was played, hmm. the degree of virtuosity, the golden tone, and so forth, all of which you can hear for yourself, she says. But they never, and here's the key word, though, speculate, she says, on what is called the under-knowledge of what is going on. Why one pianist's, quote, being unquote, makes his playing deeper, more sensitive, more alluring, more savage, more desolate, or more reverent than others. At first, when I read this, I said, well, you know, that, that's a little quaint, and it's a non-musician's non way of thinking. And yet, the more I understand it, the more we do hunger in an age of such homogenization, why does Horowitz have a certain sonority, a certain savagery, or a certain beguiling? Is there something in that being, or she calls it that under-knowledge? Can you speak of this? Because it, it's a difficult subject. What makes your Brahms second so different than Serkin's? Don't know. All that there's, energy I just gave you? The, all that energy, there's no, there, there, there's no answer to it. What makes a fingerprint different? What makes... It, it, each each individual separate without wanting to be maudlin or banal because that's that's the way you can get into all sorts of trouble by saying ah the variety of each human being is separate and, and unique unto himself but it's true in fact it is true we are different and they're with very strong personalities that comes out and that's one of the differentiations of um, uh, of artists in today's world where very often people are we're described as weaker, uh, less uh, 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 powerful personalities than in in the previous generations, the old golden age sort of personalities. Mm -hmm. Well, I I don't really think that that uh, the first rate ones have sm lesser personalities. It, there, it's just that there are more artists, and that there are there are necessarily a very small number of people who have that. D extra dimension in terms of their own work and today they need to project a human personality from the stage quite uh, as such as a Pavarotti or an Itzhak Perlman that's something th these are good examples of type that even before they sing or before they play they represent something to the public visually that has nothing to do with what happens when they Draw their bow, or or another the other. Had it as a I pianist. Mean, yes, but there are. On the other hand, uh, we were speaking about Rachmaninoff, who looked a certain way, but who expressed nothing. You saw nothing but a Buddha-like. But that was exterior. awesome too. You had Heifetz, who was the most elegant, expressionless, like a like a polished uh, um, uh, panther. Uh, or a Siamese cat, you know, who, with, mm -hmm. who radiated this incredible intensity. People said that he was cold. He was the very opposite thing to cold. He was he was the uh, reddest, whitest, mm -hmm. hot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of a performer with yeah. incredible ferocity and intensity, which was hidden underneath this exterior. All right, of, this under knowledge, in like in your own knowledge of a, a an artist of your own 
being. Before you were saying there could be nothing more wonderful than to be an artist. That's a high form of practicing anything. Uh, Anderson, who didn't know Della Rocha, but she loved her playing of the Goyescas, mm -hmm. as I do, so much. She never knew her, but she wrote, she and her art must have an identical nobility. Now, Della Rocha is just a simple woman. I don't, I can't get into her. I've met her. I've interviewed her. I've met you now once. Is there, are there, um, is there a personal information about you that comes out that can make your playing great, that made a schnabel noble or a uh, circan noble? Is there, is there some ingredient of greatness? For instance, if you are in the throes of romantic love, does that show in your playing? Um, if you're instinctive, does that show in your playing? Um, or on and on. Well, I, I think uh, instinctive... Or are you, you see, I'm getting away here from the idea of, of the servility that we, as late 20th century performers, think of the score. I am getting to think uh, the score is not so much. The more you hear different performances, the more I'm hearing the performer, even though they say this doesn't exist anymore, it's existing more and more because records are really bringing it out. Your you Schubert Sonata couldn't you be the more different. Is, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know what the answer. I think it's always was that way. You cannot hide. You cannot hide under, behind your playing. I don't know what the, is that what Margaret Anderson meant. That mm -hmm. uh, the, it, it is in the uh, it's in the ears of the listener and the eyes of the beholder, so to speak. In that uh, in that sense, the everything about a personality is manifest in their art. You said you, you said can, I wanted a different different answer from Rubinstein. Was maybe Rubinstein superficial? Was his yes. playing superficial yes, a little? Yes, he was brilliant. He was brilliant. No, not no. His playing was not superficial. His playing was not superficial. See, we're getting at something no, that is not. No, but he had he had a, he had a streak. He had certain he had certain obsessions, certain complexes, and that was a function of it. He was a gambler. He was he was uh, he he was insecure. Probably maybe because he wasn't a terribly handsome man, so that the seduction of did all of, right, didn't he? He certainly <laughs> did, both with women and the piano uh -huh. and the world. I mean, he seduced everybody. He made up for a lot of things, you know. This little Jewish boy from Poland, mm. he 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 dined with Churchill and with queens and kings. He didn't have to be a mountain man, but that was that was part of of uh, the reason he was able to succeed in this was because God gave him genius. Mm -hmm. He gave him a touch of the piano, gave him a way of expressing himself that uh, made it all turn out that way. Um, but it doesn't make it less disappointing that that sort of an answer could come from him. Yeah. Nevertheless. Are you a noble spirit? <laughs> uh, I would like to be. I certainly admire that in, in, in other people. I, would, I think that nobility is not, is not an aristocracy of economic class. It's a, it's a potential in, in a human being to look up and that's where I'd rather look than down I got it I got it do you find and I do and it's incredible you see art has now become a therapy unfortunately instead of a way of life do you find people and I know that in your youth because in mine friends would still talk about art passionately but now people are embarrassed to talk of art. We're in such a smug, materialistic society that to discuss these emotions as we are, nobility and uh, um, an attitude that, that is engendered in this conversation is embarrassing to many people. It's, they used to take it out by saying Tchaikovsky is, is no good. Mm, now wrong. you don't even talk about your enthusiasm. Rubinstein said they used to cry over my Chopin nocturnes. Now they go to Schrafts and have an ice cream cone and discuss it. It's very true. It's very sad. 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 Yeah, and there's. That's true. At the same time, the need is greater than ever, and the tendency toward vulgarization is greater than ever. That's. It's sad, but. Uh, 
as all, we haven't talked about the question of projecting everything to three and four thousand people and to millions of people now because of television. I mean, that's not again. This is not the function of music. Is a personal experience. It's it's something that depends on uh, the vo- the the ephemeral quality, the very the very ephemeralness of a performance in a limited space is so so important to for the player and the and whoever assists who's there to to observe and participate in that uh you there's so much that that goes under under underneath the uh the the attention of the of the listener in many theaters now uh or has been pointed up through dials and um, through through t- technical artificial uh, means anyway that's we, we have mm, that's important more well i don't know all right i'm going to speak of uh music schools uh in a sense here although my quote i'm going to read you comes from the artist statistician clive bell have you ever heard of him he was yes. a he wrote a book in 1913 just simply called art and it's a, it's a wonderful book Anyway, in he's that a book, Bloomsbury set. Yes, he, he, he's, he's so married good. to uh, he's married to uh, Virginia Woolf's uh, sister, a painter, mm-hmm. Roger Fry, yes, and indeed. all those people. Yes, indeed. He's yes, a indeed. most interesting man. He is a radical. He said, "Art schools do nothing but harm. In schools, there must be a criterion of excellence, and that criterion cannot be an artistic one." No master can make a student into an artist, but he can, and most do, turn them into imposters, maniacs, criminals, or just cretins, the unfortunate boys and girls who had been made artists by nature. They were. It is not the master's fault, and he ought not to be blamed. He is there to bring all his pupils to a certain standard of efficiency, agreeable by inspector, appreciable by inspectors, and by the general public. And is this not a definition of what music schools has turned into via the competitions now? I don't know. Okay. I don't know because I don't know much about music schools now. Um, I do know what I think, which is not t- terribly distant from what. Uh, Clive Bell wrote. I mean, he's talking about the British system of inspectors and mm-hmm. all that. Well, it's the so same thing. The jury at the schools. I, th- I and think the... what I think what counts is the pupil and not the teacher. Mm-hmm. I think the teacher, um, if he a, a teacher is a is a tit to be suckled on by a, a pupil. A pupil has to be attracted to. Whatever it is that he's or he or she is interested in, uh, in uh, in emulating and first in absorbing. Now, in doing this, I'm describing what I th- think is my own uh, uh, method of learning. When I was a youngster, there was something that I wanted from Casals as a cellist, or Heifetz as a violinist, or Toscanini as a conductor. Totally unrelated to the piano, but was very related in what I wanted to do in music, something that inspired me, I wanted to appropriate. I, what was important was what I was able to absorb from my mentors, whether they were mentors in my fantasies, such as Schnabel, to whom I went one New Year's Day and said, let's play four hands because I was too nervous to play for him. And he told later, he told Claude Frank, imagine the nerve of that young man coming I asked him to play, and he said, let's play four hands. <laughs> Imagine such a thing. Whereas I knew him so well, I knew Schnabel so well, and I knew what his reaction to me would be. So that I tried to, tried to slip in, as it were, to get in through to sort of impressing him by playing with him. It would become apparent soon enough that I knew what he was all about because I had studied him so so carefully i knew ev- everything he had nothing to teach me at that at that point or so i thought I'm sure he did really have plenty to teach me but at that point i had really truly and as the same is true with rubenstein the same is true with all my heroes that i described to you earlier and others what was important was what I did. You could have Socrates and Plato and everybody else in the world to teach you. If you're not going to 
want to learn from them. If you're in that, if that example is not absorbed, taken in like a sponge, and then what's what's alien is rejected, and what's there is absorbed into the into the system of of the of the individual, the plant, this thing that 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 grows. So to me, everything is a pupil. As a teacher, I've been I I've never, I listen. To anybody who wants to play for me, I listen to, and I give them sometimes very painful. I, I don't like to do it, but I do it because sometimes I have to say, uh, "You should do something else because you're never going to." Usually, they come and they want advice as to how to make their careers. They don't want answers to sure. how to play. I was 106. No. They want to know which managers to go of to. Course, of course, of course. Uh, it's amazing, it's amazing, amazing thing. So then I have to say, well, you're going to you're in a lot of trouble because you're not more talented than Murray Pariah and you're not more talented than than Peter Serkin and you've got some rather stiff competition. Cecile Licard, you know, are you do you think you you can compete with these? This is a hard world. Well, anyway, what uh, the most important thing is that an individual whom a youngster, an artist whom a youngster wants to absorb from, has to make himself available. And to me, that's the highest form of flattery. I don't know an artist that isn't, hasn't made himself available or herself available. If a young, gifted person comes to Alicia de la Rocha or to Horowitz or to anybody, and says, uh, this here, I play, uh, and I, what do you think of this and what do you think of that? It'll be the rare, rare case that will say, go away, I don't want to, I have got time for you. And then, uh, what the youngster is able, how the youngster is able to transform what he learns, and you or she learns, by watching, by observing, not necessarily by listening to rules, but by absorb, ab absorbing the whole personality and translating that into their own terms, uh, they, this passes through like a, like a, like a, through a sort of psychic artistic digestive tract, <laughs> if I can use harsh, crude terminology. But that's in fact what happens. Some people are good for the system, and some cause diarrhea. You know, <laughs> and. Uh, um, but it's all it happens in the area of the pupil. On another level, it happens on the level of the teacher. And I think that that's what Clive Bell was talking about. When you've got mediocre talent, then you need a teacher. Then you, as you go, you're taken as far as you can go. And your pedagogues, your Vengaravas, your Galamians, these, this is where they do their virtuoso. Mm -hmm. 